Today's webinar will be presented by the native Delawarean Bill Brown, whose degree in agricultural sciences with an animal science and agricultural economics major led him to work in the poultry industry for over 20 years on Delmarva with Purdue Farms. His responsibilities were in live operations and grow out, special projects, hatchery management, and new poultry house construction and sales. While at Purdue, Bill was known in the industry as a ventilation expert and trainer and served as the company's ventilation specialist. Since 2009, Bill has served as the University of Delaware State Poultry Extension Agent, located in the heart of Sus Sussex County, the leading U.S. county in broiler production for many years. As a poultry agent, Bill serves the hundreds of Delaware farm families that grow broilers, the integrators that produce poultry products, and the allied industry that supports their businesses, in addition to managing 230,000 of his own broilers. So Bill, uh, why don't you take it away for us? We're very much looking forward to your presentation today. All right. Well, Sarah, thank you um, for, for inviting me to, uh, to share some information. And, and I think, um, you know, I'll, I'll just get into this. And, and folks, I, you know, I can handle this one of two ways if uh, we have a chat a chat box here. If the, if we see questions come up, uh, feel free to put those in, and uh, it might be easier just to handle questions as they arise. But I but I always like to begin by by thanking um, th thanking folks that were that were involved in this. What what you're going to see is really uh, about four winners worth of work. Um, and there's a number of individuals and associations, groups, if you will, that helped. Uh, Dr. Jennifer Timmons, who is now with UMES, uh, UMES uh, she was with the University of Maryland Extension System when she was working with, on this project. Mr. Paul Spees is the, uh, is the Agricultural Liaison with the Chester River Association. They are an environmental group uh, located on the northern end of the shore that really has really has worked with agriculture and and uh, uh, very 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 good folks to work with Ernst Seed I know a number of you probably know that name um, they, at least initially they provided some bedding for us the Delaware Department of Ag uh, Ed Key and his group uh, provided some some in some in kind provided some funding to help us get started and then the integrators. There, um, there's five here on the shore, but uh, four in Delaware, but certainly Amick Farms, Purdue, and Allen Harem. Dr. John Moyle, uh, my counterpart uh, in Salisbury, Maryland. He's the poultry extension specialist. Amy Jacobs from the Nature Conservancy um, was involved in, in this. Jim Passwaters from DPI, um, and certainly Dr. Bridget McCray from uh, poultry extension uh, at Delaware State University. So as you can see, there were a number of, of people involved and I always like to credit folks uh, for what they've done. So let's get started. Poultry bedding here on the Eastern Shore historically has always had three issues. One, we need a lot of it and uh, you know the availability of it, it's always been a scarcity and I'll get into this in a little bit. The other issue, quite frankly, is one of quality. As we are moving towards antibiotic-free and, and uh, different types of um, uh, issues, organics, uh, you know, the quality of how we start birds is essential. Uh, birds are vulnerable to different types of molds like aspergillosis. So we've always had an issue of quality, and I'll, I'll get into that a little bit. And then finally is cost. Because it's a scarcity, it's it's a very expensive commodity. It's really a commodity here. The uh, the Delmarva Peninsula, um, and I'm, this is just general background, but we basically raise about seven percent of the Nash of the of the birds of the nine billion birds that are grown in the in the continental U.S. Um, Sussex County, Delaware, which is the, the lower county there, uh, if you go back even to World War II, it was the number one county in broiler production, even back to the Second World War. But uh, at any given time, we have about 120 million birds uh, under roof, 
and most of these farms are raising somewhere four and a half to five flocks a year. So we we produce 60 million birds a year, and that's a lot of a lot of bedding requirements. Historically, we've used uh, here are just some examples of some different products that I've used. Uh, but certainly your soft and hardwood shavings, ground corn cobs, uh, peanut hulls are very popular in, in uh, Virginia and North Carolina, rice hulls in the Delta, uh, certainly Arkansas. Um, cocoa hulls, believe it or not, from Hershey Chocolate. I've grown, uh, I've grown broilers with uh, these. Uh, they're about 7% moisture, very dry, and they make the house smell great. But trust me, after about three weeks, it smells like a chicken house. Um, certainly cotton gin, uh, trash, uh, uh, there have been issues there. We've gotten away from that with uh, the bow weevil and some of the, some of the organophosphates that were required to control that. Dried sugar cane uh, was popular, believe it or not. Beach sand was used uh, many, many years ago. There was a product made from uh, um, recycled paper. It was called Dysobed. And, um, and that had had some problems associated. You know, you get into Canada and Europe and a lot of Canadians and, and Europeans uh, process straw, much like what I'm going to show you here today. And believe it or not, there's actually a system being developed uh, that will be litterless. Um, and it's problematic, but, but again, it's being looked at uh, at some different land grant colleges. So, that kind of gives you a background of different products that are used under under uh, floor rear chickens. I uh, visited a turkey Iowa uh, uh, Iowa turkey operation, excuse me, uh, probably three three years ago, and I point this out because up in Iowa you've got uh, you know uh, oats. Oats are very grown, you know, for human consumption and. Uh, these turkeys, you're looking at oat hulls underneath these uh, this flock of turkeys. As I, this was, yeah, this was an Iowa farm. But I, it just goes to prove the point that a lot of times you use what's available in an area. Here on Delmarva, as I was explaining to Sarah, we, we, um, we've always had a scarcity, but you can see what happened to our pine sawmills we lost 75% uh, of those sawmills uh, over a period of time and quite frankly um, a lot of that capacity had to be replaced by trucking it in where you can imagine what that does to cost. So <clears throat> I always look at my work in extension you know if I'm not fulfilling if I don't know and understand the needs of my customer how can I do the job as an extensionist. So this was something that I knew there was a need for. The other thing that was interesting about the sawmills, um, they produce only about a third that's actually dry. Um, and as I said, this is problematic for the birds. In fact, a lot of the newer technologies, they would um, actually make smaller blades so they could get more bored feet out of uh, green lumber. And of course, with a smaller blade, the way you you had to lubricate it by putting water through it. Well, you can imagine if you're putting water through a system that's producing sawdust, you're getting wet, wet sawdust. I'll show you show you this in a minute. Um, you know, sawdust in many many cases. I've measured sawdust that went into went into chicken houses in uh, December and January that. You know, half of it was water, uh, for goodness sakes. And, you know, that is very problematic when you have to heat that, you have to dry that down. Um, and farmers, quite frankly, never knew until the stuff arrived, you know, what the quality was going to be. If they, if they happened to luck out and get dried shavings, they would get material that um, they could work with. But the bottom line was quality was very, very... Um, uh, just a lot of variability in that. And here's why. Many times uh, these sawmills would produce the byproduct and it would and it would get rained on. And uh, so you can imagine what that would lead to. 
Um, over time, there's been some alternative systems as nutrient management has become uh, ever increasing um, an issue for many poultry farms. There's really a limited, there's maybe a 10 week window in the spring. And you can imagine that if you're having to replace all this bedding, uh, you know, the av truck availability and just getting product to farms, just the logistical problem. Well, there's actually been an entrepreneur here on the shore that actually invested in a, in a plant that would take uh, call loblolly pines, chip them, run them through a, a, an actual oven and dry it down to about 10% and then would, would wrap them. And you're looking at bales. These bales uh, would be uh, brought into the chicken house and, and they actually are quite dry. Um, so that's, uh, but again, it goes back to expense. It was a very, it's a very expensive proposition. Uh, to give you a, a sense of what I'm talking about in terms of market, uh, there are 125 million square feet here on uh, Del Marva that's growing chickens. Um, if we were to clean these houses out every year and put three inches back to five inches, you're looking at 31 to 52 million cubic feet at a cost of 15 to 26 million dollars. So this is uh, this just gives you some idea of the scope of what I'm talking about. But um, the bottom line is that uh, birds today uh, are grown on a built-up litter system. We do recondition the litter, and it's primarily a result of demand, availability, quality, and cost. So that gives you some sense of why we wanted to move forward with this project. The first farm. Uh, happened to be an Amic uh, farm. Uh, they're one of our integrators here. This farm was located in Greenwood. Uh, we had some sponsors, DPI, our Delaware Department of Ag, Earned Seed. Um, we, we did have some collaboration. You see that there. And, and we learned. We learned a tremendous amount. Uh, we chose switchgrass for all the, all the right reasons, the, bio, you know, the CO2 biosequestration and the soil conservation and it's a native plant. I mean, there were just all kinds of reasons that we uh, that we chose this plant. Um, as I said, um, I think I was telling Sarah, the Chester River Association is located primarily up in Kent County, Maryland. And at the time I first came in contact with them, they had over 600 acres, primarily on dairy farms. But this was uh, these were lands that were uh, marginal, that uh, interfaced with the Chester River, and uh, so they got grants and they actually got pretty good establishment. This is a two-year stand um, that I went and visited with my friend Paul Spees. Here's a four-year stand. You can see the amount of, of, uh, of material. Um, off to the right here, you can see we, we basically uh, square baled it. Those bales are 550 to 600 pounds um, and they they can be easily transported um, and that's what we did we harvested them primarily in a square bale and then we moved them you know we moved them to uh, uh, to, to far to to our farms where we processed um, again we we produced uh, the earth seed actually um, produce this using a tub grinder, but I want to point out, if you look very carefully at that floor, you'll see these long rogue pieces. And that's just the nature of a tub grinder. Um, I have a picture, we opened one up and tried to change out the screens, and i just be honest with you, very difficult to do, but I was not satisfied with, uh, it just was not a very homogeneous product and it and what typically will happen as the birds begin to work that bedding the long pieces gravitate to the top and of course the long pieces then mat up particularly under your water lines and begin to start caking and that is certainly problematic for us um, in the broiler industry so if you just take a peek at that you'll you know we'll, I'll be talking about that some more here so the first farm, I basically went to this gentleman and I said, listen, uh, just want to take a look at this. 
I want to put switchgrass on one. This is one chicken house. I put switchgrass on one side and uh, we put a center fence in the middle and we did our traditional pine dust or sawdust in the, on the other side and we'll, we'll put a fence and separate those. At the hatchery we basically paired the chicks. Now this was not a split fed house so we did not have the ability to measure feed conversion but I, I really just wanted to see how the material would behave and the advantage of doing this in the same house it takes out all that statistical noise because you're you know you have the same ventilation you know the same um, conditions basically in a situation like this so uh, we learned a lot we learned a lot from this farm uh, one of the things that we learned is that y you cannot spread uh, switchgrass bedding in conventional methods most um, particularly uh, pine um, um, shavings or dust is spread with a with a with a crusting fork and it flows easily under a blade not so with switchgrass absolutely not the case with switchgrass uh, we actually ended up using on this farm in Greenwood we used a hay tether and um, it's over here now, anyway you, you see my arrow this is this is a uh, used in the this is actually used in the uh, uh, hay industry uh, there we go okay and Michelle Wolford's here next to me so she's guiding me here but anyway this 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 worked well but I will tell you we we barely had enough clearance to get that through a 12 foot uh, door jam but there it is going down through the middle and it did an actually pretty good job we later found that um, landscaping rakes these are counter rotating drums that can be put on the front of a bobcat that does a marvelous job as well so we learned that we had to uh, work with this product differently here's a high priced unit which I never purchased this is a Canadian as I said the Canadian folks use an awful lot of um, uh, processed straw and uh, you know this unit here was like five grand and uh, I was not going to put that kind of money in a unit like that but in any event it it, it worked you know it, 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 it worked as well you can purchase these things uh, here's one outside of a farm on Delmarva um, again it just mounts on the front end of a bobcat very important however to get these floors leveled um, again you're going to be putting putting the lines down very important that chicks have access uh, consistent access to water lines um, you know you're dealing with a 40 gram chick and um, you have to get those floors level uh, otherwise that can cut off some birds from drinking properly and of course it is a nightmare to try to try to control you can see a little bit of unevenness in these lines but that uh, you basically just let the you do that to the contour in this particular house you can see our center partition about halfway up I'm I'm actually sitting at the brood curtain you see the black curtain on the other end of this chamber I'm sitting on that bottom board and uh, taking the picture so you can see on the other side was our our pine and uh, these birds were paired at the at the hatchery so we had the same genetics on both sides again um, one of the things that I quickly observed was see how this these rogue pieces came to the surface your finer materials were down lower if you will uh, you know in in the lower part of this this was about three inches and again where you have the most pressure which is underneath these water lines that's where some of these long pieces began to mat so the tub grinder just really did not do the job we were we were hoping hoping for. And again, we grew these birds. This uh, this bird is about eight weeks old, um, male and female, and uh, and and we actually did quite well. Um, I've got some results from it, but uh, the bedding did quite well. Uh, we we found that the best way to handle. Um, after the first flock we would windrow this is a common practice here 
where we allow the, the material to go through a heat. That's really what we're after. And this machine actually goes through and creates a windrow pile, uh, 18 to 24 inch pile. I've got uh, some pictures. This is a colleague of mine. Um, what I wanted to do is I wanted to take the windrow and I actually wanted to look at what kind of temperatures. Those are thermistors that we put down about eight inches into that pile and we're just tying them into a data logger. And here was some of our results. Um, this is over a, a, a seven day period. The blue represents the heat that we created. This is, you know, day one through day seven. And uh, the blue basically represents the sawdust and the red represents the switchgrass. Well, you can see that after the second day, we actually got higher temperatures with the switchgrass. And I really believe that was porosity because these thermophilic bacteria require uh, uh, oxygen to breathe and I think the, uh, the switchgrass was just a more porous a more porous product. When we turned the material which was day four you can see the temperature went down here on the 14th and then the temperature went back up again and um, but we consistently after the second day we got higher temperatures so Proper wind rowing was certainly not a problem uh, compared to sawdust. Uh, we got very, very good temp. Those are excellent temperatures, by the way. Uh, the sidewalls, we, we found that the best way to handle that um, was to pulverize it. This is uh, actually a prefer. It's made in Arkansas. Uh, Dr. Susan Watkins was involved in developing this, but it's a hinged, it's, I call it a glorified uh, rototiller, but that's not really given its service either because it um, moves at a high RPM and what it does is it shatters and breaks up uh, cake material. So we found uh, pulverizing was something that we really needed to do after, after we windrowed to break up the, the cookies, we call them. We went back in and we re-leveled the floors using this hay tether. And again, it, you know, we used what we what we had. You know, that's the neat part about extension, is you just you use what you have. And um, you know, this was uh, this was a, a farmer in the area. He actually grew buffalo, um, and he did quite a bit of uh, harvest, quite a bit of hay. So he helped me out here. So here were some of our results. Um, the word Paul is a fancy word. That's the chicken foot. And uh, there is an, in, an insatiable market. It is millions and millions and millions of dollars. Most of these uh, chicken feet go into Asia. Um, and, um, and when they are burnt, in other words, when uh, the uric acid sticks to the bottom of the feet, it can cause burns and ulcers, and, it, and that downgrades the product, not to mention the fact that it's also a, uh, a welfare issue and a food safety issue. But what we saw uh, with, the, with grade A, now this was out of the plant, we actually had a 10% advantage to, uh, to the switchgrass. Um, the starting moisture, the switchgrass bedding that came to me from... Um, I think it was Meadville. It's right up on the, I think, um, Meadville. I think it's Pennsylvania. Anyway, it's very, it's really up there. I think it's very close to the Canadian border, um, but it's a long way away. But that material that came in, <clears throat> um, came in at 18% moisture. The sawdust that we got was almost half. Remember, you saw my slide early. What we saw is uh, certainly uh, if you underventilate any any new litter, if you underventilate it, allow humidity to, to climb, you will get caking, and that and certainly the the, the salt the switchgrass bedding was not immune to that. We certainly learned that we needed to handle uh, switchgrass differently than the sawdust, and I've talked about that. Um, we there is a need to windrow it and pulverize it after the first flock, and this was a piece that we really had to figure out moving down the road. Um, we thought that there would be, you know, some cost advantages over sawdust. So we'll get into that as we get towards the end of the presentation. Um, 
the next farm was uh, was actually a Purdue farm, and I worked with Jennifer Timmons, Rehoboth, Maryland, and uh, down there we we did some of the same things. Now this farmer did not level the floor as well. He, they did not use, and you can see how uneven that is and how wavy that is. So I can't I can't reiterate it's important to understand that this is a product that needs to be handled well. Again, this product was uh, processed with a tub grinder. You can see the long pieces throughout. But uh, regardless of that, we had some pretty good results. Dr. Jennifer Timmons, um, Jen uh, was at uh, University of Maryland at the time, and she's actually doing some ammonia readings. We uh, did some passive ammonia readings in these commercial houses. The product did amazingly well uh, on the floor. Uh, very dry conditions. Birds love life. They, they really did well. Um, we, um, we systematically went through and randomly caught uh, pens of birds. And we took pictures. And uh, we actually used a scoring system to score the, the paws. And uh, that's a mess of work, I'm telling you, particularly when it's hot. These were some of the performance results. Statistically, we really didn't see any, um, you know, there was, you could say, well, the birds were slightly, um, you know, they were slightly lighter. They, they might have been a point maybe higher on feed. Those are not statistically significant. Uh, for whatever reason, the grower did not burn as much fuel. But the bottom line is when you look at performance cost, we actually had, we were 22 hundredths of a cent uh, in better in cost overall um, on the, uh, you know, on the switchgrass. So uh, we gave up a little bit of a weight, but again, that really was not a statistical, statistically significant. Uh, the Pauls, again, I mean, most plants try to try to achieve about 2% of their live weight coming through a processing plant. But uh, here, in both cases, the switch and the controls were 90% grade A pack out. So, uh, I mean, if we could keep every farm coming in like that, um, there would be no complaints from plant managers, trust me. Um, so moderate and severe, they just, the, the litter conditions were phenomenal. Um, we, the next winter, we actually went to a, uh, another integrator, we actually went to Amick Farms, and uh, they had a farm up in the Harrington area. And this guy was split fed, excuse me. This guy was split fed, meaning he had feed bins on each end. Um, it, it was a, originally built as a center brooded roaster house, so we had the ability to keep feed separate. I will tell you, uh, we lost some results because it was mixed up at the feed mill. We had and uh, any of body that's been involved in in any type of field research will understand this is what I'm talking about this is the tub grinder down here to the bottom right we borrowed that from a from a livestock producer a feedlot lot a feedlot operator in the Harrington area and inside here you can see the to the left here you can see the screen um, the screens yeah here we are you can see the screen, those screens. Now, let me tell you, this, uh, this farm had used this to feed cattle, and these screens were much larger than what we needed. It took us probably two hours, a lot of uh, PB blaster, and uh, we tore our knuckles up getting that, getting that screen out. But these hammers would come around and actually uh, work the material. You drop the, you drop the bales in through the top, and this hammer would drive the uh, switchgrass down through the bottom of this. And I've got a picture here in a minute to show you. Okay. So here we are. Um, we brought a contractor in that actually uh, offloaded from the, from the truck, dropped it into the top, and here we're actually processing the switchgrass. And here it is being, being dumped. You can see logistically you're not going to get this done on farms. You're just, you simply logistically don't have the time. Uh, we clearly recognize that we would have to have a system where this material would be processed off site and actually brought in already processed or this would never, this would never fly.
And uh, so we quickly learned that. Here's just another, whoops, I guess that's a, okay. Um, from there, we approached a, a, a Korean company that operates here on the shore, Allen Hurry. And uh, they're kind of unique. They have about 10 or 12 company-owned farms. And we actually got permission uh, to use one of their company farms to do some of this research. And here's where we brought in this rotochopper. This is a phenomenal piece of equipment. Phenomenal. It, um, it too has a series of screens, but uh, we were actually able here, we're actually putting the screen up underneath the cutter blades, which is up in this area. This is the, the flooring mechanism that actually brings the, the 500 pound bale, but we found Sorry, is that you dragging that around, Michelle? Yeah, you got to click on the green. <laughs> yeah, I'm right. sorry. I'm sorry. I'm a, I'm a neophyte when it comes to doing this, folks. So just bear with me. Um, yeah, but uh, this this active floor, I mean, we could process a 550-pound bale in a bat. We timed it. I think it was like 55 seconds. But this is just an incredible machine and, and did a much, much better job in terms of processability but here we are processing the material here's your bales we're loading it on and uh, very dusty might add a very dusty uh, process but like I said you're not going to get this done on a wholesale basis it's just simply not going to happen so we quickly recognize that we're going to have to have an entrepreneur set up to to run this but here we are, we, we brought it in with a bucket. We basically put it in equidistant piles down through the middle. And then we came in and we spread that. And, and you can see um, birds, birds really, really do well on this stuff. Our last study was with uh, a roaster farm in the Milford area. It happened to be under contract with Purdue. And they were gracious enough to work with us. Um, Again, here was, uh, you know, just some over a, a three flock period. Um, you know, we, we saw virtually no, uh, no statistical difference in livability. Um, we, we actually saw a little bit of a depression in weight. And if, you know, if that was probably one of the, I can't really explain that, but we did see just a little, we gave up just a little bit in weight. Um, and by the way, that's 8.36 pounds and 2 point, or 8.29 pounds. Fee conversion, uh, we more than made up for it. So we actually got some pretty good caloric conversions um, with, with the switchgrass. And, and this was fairly consistent. Um, one of the things, though, that we did have... We, we did see an advantage. Um, we had, a, had almost an 85% grade A pack out over three flocks with switchgrass compared to 77%. Now, I wanted to say that there were some housing issues um, here that contributed to this number and um, don't want to really get into any details, but Basically, it, uh, the bottom line was we, we were able to produce um, birds of equal quality using, using the bedding. So uh, at the end of the day, we wanted to kind of put a business model together. And again, this was, this was processing mm -hmm. the material on the farm. We, you know, obviously the farmer that grows it needs to get something, you know, for his or her time. We, uh, we obviously need to mow it, bale it, field stack it, and cover it. We need to freight it to the, to, the, to the farm. We then need to process it. So we've got, you know, some money tied up in it. And basically what we did is we looked at uh, the switchgrass versus the pine, and uh, we saw about a 15% savings. Now, I want to say to you that this number I did not particularly control. Uh, we, uh, we were given a certain amount of bedding material that went to the farm, you know, the pine that went to the farm, and we only ended up with about two inches. So we actually grew chickens on two inches of bedding versus we got three inches of switchgrass. And um, 
So I will, I will get into that in a minute. But we found to get the three inches, we needed uh, about three quarters of a ton per square foot. And, and I've used that with Miscanthus. I've used that with other warm season grasses. And I, I think that's a pretty good number. Um, three inches, in my opinion, is still marginal. I think we probably need four inches to really, and some integrators would prefer four or five rather. But, uh, but the bottom line is this was, this was not apples to apples. And some of that was not under my direct control. And that's one of the, one of the issues when you're, when you're dealing with field type work like this. <laughs> So at the uh, at the end of the day, and I'm I'm uh, actually uh, I'm right on time. Um, some of our demonstration um, summaries: we had five farms over three winters, uh, ten houses of switchgrass with three different integrators. So um, we had quite a good quite a good participation, I think. Uh, some of the takeaways that we learned is. Um, uh, that certainly, uh, um, if it's properly processed, uh, it is a it's a cost-effective bedding alternative for growing for growing meat birds. Um, certainly, we saw no quality or performance disadvantages. I can't stress enough; it has to be handled properly. Um, we do have guidance available um, from the university. We have a fact sheet from the University of Delaware and Maryland um, that we co-wrote that uh, will help, um, you know, give some of this guidance. So we, um, you know, we, we did, um, um, you know, we were, we were pleased at the outcomes. Now, let me see, I'm looking at the chat box. Um, it says for the second trial, was the house set up similar to the first one? No, uh, it wasn't. The second trial was actually a paired trial where we had uh, two identical houses with the same equipment, same setup. But even with that, there's enough statistical noise in that. Um, uh, there's enough statistical noise in that that it makes it very difficult. The first farm, I basically took one house and I put switchgrass on one side of the fence and pine on the other and that was mainly for my benefit to see how the stuff would do and um, and we learned a lot from it and we just it was a different setup uh, uh, oh Paul Patterson how you doing Paul uh, Bill in the first farm it looks like a lot of dust in the houses could you comment on the fine particle size and dustiness of the two products and then how does this compare with the roto chop switchgrass um, there's no question that the finer you make the material, the more dust you're going to create. Um, you know, you know, in my first experience, the 18% moisture compared to the 48% moisture, you know, uh, products with higher moisture content just doesn't have the dust load. But um, yeah, the material is dusty. I would say no more so than, you know, other products, but, uh, but you do need protection and you know and, and all that so it can be handled no one doing it commercially um so bill real, real quick um, do you see a difference in dustiness between the rotor chop switchgrass and the tub ground switchgrass no not really mm -mm. nope no nope. i'm sorry that was probably the question and i just missed that no there was not uh is anyone doing it commercially um at least here on the Delmarva, not that I'm aware of. Um, we have lots of folks that would like to grow it, and we have lots of folks that would like to provide material into it. Um, I know a lot of the folks that are growing with the Chester River, they send a lot of their material uh, to Kennett Square as mushroom hay, and, um, and they grow, you know, they grow a, a lot of mushrooms with it. Uh, they incorporate other products, including broiler manure, I might add. And all in all, do you think switchgrass will become bedding, uh, common bedding for broiler houses? I think it has the potential to, but I think it's going to depend on an entrepreneur coming in and 
and basically making some investments in processing. Um, I know there's a company that is successful using miscanthus. They have a business model where they'll come into an area, they'll plant miscanthus, and then they'll process miscanthus. So, um, you know, that's as much as I know. Is there any difference in handling switchgrass after you need to dispose of it? No, but that's a very good question. There was um, a number of farmers were asking me about germination of switchgrass. Because let me tell you, Swiss switchgrass produces a bunch of fine, fine seed. And what we did is we went in and we cored out uh, some of the, some of the uh, switchgrass bedding uh, down to the substrate. And I actually took it to a commercial greenhouse. We spread it on trays to try to germinate um, switchgrass seed. We got n n no switchgrass, but we hatched out an awful lot of lesser mealworms, which scared the, the dickens out of the greenhouse operator. He didn't know. He, had never, he wasn't familiar with uh, darkling beetles at all. So, uh, yeah, we hatched, we hatched a lot of them, <laughs> but that's just uh, par for the course. Can you really say it is cost effective? Um, the answer to that question is going to depend on centralizing a processing area. If we have to deliver the material and process it like I did in these 10 houses, no way. It is not cost effective. It will not work. Um, well, for many reasons, but we... Um, we did not we did not see as big a cost savings as we had hoped it was more like 15 percent um and um but we do think that if if someone were to make an investment and you know get some economy of scale that yes there would be some savings um uh, compared to some of the available the big thing is is availability we need bedding and uh, as we move away from, you know, a lot of antibiotics and so forth, we're, you know, we're going to be dealing with necrotic enteritis. We're going to be dealing with wetter floors. We're going to be removing more wet material out of houses. And we've got to have replacement bedding. Uh, how many times can you win row and reuse? Well, um, you know, that really can be done over and over. I, um you know, I don't really have the answer to that, but I've, you know, I've been to farms that have been years uh, between, you know, since they've done a total clean out. Now, they do have to remove manure from the houses, but they are reusing the, the, the material. Um, the, um, the thing that this, this question does remind me of is basically after two flocks, this material will handle like any other bedding. Uh, whether it's you know pine or cocoa hulls or whatever, so after after two grow out cycles, you can you can level it back with a blade. It it becomes very uh, user friendly, you know, at that point. But you know, folks, I wanted to say that you know my my goal was not to learn how to grow switchgrass. My goal was not to learn how to how to cut it or process it. My goal was real well. I'm I mean, cut it and bale it. But my goal was to really evaluate, um, you know, once it hit a chicken house, what do we need to do with that product? And, and I think we accomplished, you know, we accomplished uh, that in terms of what. I don't think I have any other slides. Sarah. Nope, I have a thank you. And uh, Sarah, you asked me to stay at uh, 40 to 45 minutes. So I've, I've, landed, the, I've landed the plane on the, on the deck carrier. Yeah, you did a fantastic job, uh, and we have plenty of time to go through some more questions. If you don't mind, Bill, I'm just going to circle back to a, a couple of the nuances of, of a few of the questions that have been asked already. You mentioned uh, the need for an entrepreneurial person to come in and, and sort of establish um, assistance with the processing and logistics part of this in order to really reach those markets you're talking about. Can you kind of address the, the scale? I assume that the entrepreneur that you're looking for would be a person who would handle uh, the chopping, processing, and delivery. Uh, you can that's, correct me if I'm wrong about that. Yeah, yeah that, that's correct. And, and okay. again, what, what is really required there? 
See, the Delmarva Peninsula is kind of unique in the fact that the five integrators through their contract uh, provide the bedding. So really what is needed here is a commitment uh, from these integrators to say, hey, we will, we will give you a portion of our business. Um, and what that does is that gives, you know, somebody that's establishing themselves, you know, a, um, you know, basically, I, for lack of a better term, a, a guaranteed market where they, they know they're going to be able to move a certain volume. Because you're a roto chopper, for example, like you saw in that picture. I went online and looked at one of those um, used. It was a quarter of a million bucks. And uh, when you throw in a tractor that was necessary to, to, to take that down the road and all the permitting and, and what, what would be involved in that. Now that, like I said, that's a mobile unit. Um, those folks go around dairy farms up in Lancaster and up in that area and they, they grind uh, haylage for a lot of dairy farms. Um, and, that, and that was something that I found somewhat frustrating too. Here on the Delmarva Peninsula, we virtually have, well, we have a, just a few dairies left, you know, a beef cow here, a beef cow there. But um, when I started looking for tub grinders, I mean, it was like looking for a needle in a haystack. So, um, you know, a lot of these folks, we had to, you know, we had to go outside our, of our immediate region to try to, you know, try to find some folks to help. But yeah, it, it would require an entrepreneur that would handle the, you know, basically would, would contract with people that are growing the switchgrass, coordinate the delivery, they would process, maybe they would bag the material, deliver the material so that it's on farms, ready to spread. And, um, and it would require somebody like that to really make a system like this work. And there would be some economies of scale that would be gained by doing all of that. And based on your experience in the industry, you see the possibility of advance contracts to be in place even before the establishment of such a business or only once the, such a business has been established? Sir, I can't answer that. I, I, I don't know. I, you know, um, probably a gentleman that is more um, qualified to answer that would be Paul Spees, the agricultural liaison with the Chester River Group. Um, you know, to let you know, it's no secret, we do have one integrator here on the shore that has expressed some interest in, in, um, in a hundred houses of this material. And, um, and we're trying to entice a third party to come in and, and set up. And I don't want to get into the nitty gritty of all that, but that that's really what it's going to take to, to make something like this work. What's All the right. scale that you'd really need to see in a business like that uh, in terms of delivery in tons or, or pounds or, or whatever unit you're, the industry would work with? Uh, I'm sorry, Sarah, ask again. Oh, so the for a business like this, what's the scale that would be of interest for one of those large integrators in terms of tons per year um, or, or even in terms of a geographic footprint for that kind of service? Yeah, I, I mean, I think 100 houses was a realistic number. Um, basically, you need about, um, if I recall, I think you need uh, 13 to 15 tons of processed switchgrass on, a, you know, a, a 40 by 500, which is a fairly common house size. Some of the larger houses that are 60 feet by 500 or so, you know, you're looking at 20 to 21 tons of processed switchgrass. So, you know, you can do the math. You know, if you have 100, 100 houses, that's, that's a lot of material. And, um, and so, you know, no, no integrator cleans out every house every year. That's just not going to happen. Um, you know, number one, we don't have the trucks to get the new bedding to the farms. There's just a lot of logistical issues that would be required. And um, originally we were thinking, well, you know, growers could buy, you know, a forage chopper, you know, international harvester forage chopper. And there might be some individuals that could get that done. But trust me, as a, as a broiler grower myself, the last thing I want to do is invest in forage choppers and, you know, planters and, and, you know, products that I'll need to harvest I just have no interest. I have too many other things to do. 
So, and I think the majority of the growers here would, would say that to you. So it's really going to take a, a third party uh, to invest and make something like this work. Sure. Uh, and Paul, forgive my lack of expertise uh, in this field, but are there are there issues around seasonality of delivery? Um, is it is it fairly consistent to predict when material will be needed? Is it really one time of the year or is it throughout the year? There, there's typically two times of the year, but, um, you know, Sarah, the when, when we remove nutrients from a broiler house today, um, you're not nilly willy, just you're applying it on land. Uh, most nutrient management plans are very specific about timing. Uh, so a lot of the material, uh, you know, you have a 10 week window, uh, which really starts in February and it, and it ends basically by the time corn is in the ground. So you have a 10 week window in the spring, you have a very short window in the fall that you can do some clean outs. Um, most of the manure storage on broiler houses are strictly for this reconditioned, we call it cake. This is removing the, the wet material from a house and we temporarily store that and, and most farms have the ability to store six to eight months of cake, okay. if you will. But um, so, so yes, there, there are certainly windows that and that's the problem. It's feast or famine because, you know, everybody wants to clean out in that 10 week window. And you can imagine the pressure there is on equipment, uh, tractor trailers and so forth, so on. So this is why I'm saying that if we could develop a system that would process and bag and I mean, you know, ag bags. Um, I mean, we've even thought of things like putting it in these long silage bags, you know, processing it, putting in long silage bags. I mean, they're, there, there are some different uh, business models that could probably work, but you have to get the material into the production site before the farmer is ready to clean out. I think that is an absolute essential to making it work. Yeah, it's Paul, Patterson, Paul Patterson says here, uh, or growers might grow and contractors could custom cut and chop. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think a system like that, um, you know, would work. Um, you know, I mean, I, as a farmer, I have maybe 50 acres of incidental land that, that I, I don't even get enough income to pay taxes on it. So if I had the ability to, uh, the, the cool part about switchgrass and some of these warm season grasses, you're looking at a one-time investment and you can cut the material, um, you know, over and over, over many, many years. So you're looking at, uh, you know, material that could, you know, that could, over time, you're looking at, uh, at a fairly low, low input cost. So, um, anyway, yeah, I agree, Paul. I think uh, growers could grow and, and uh, contractors could come in and cut it and chop it. Yeah. Yeah, it seems that the demand you mentioned around spring and fall aligns pretty nicely with the, with switchgrass management where it can be harvested in, in fall or in many cases it can overwinter in the field and then be harvested very early um, the, the following growing season. Yeah, so yeah. What, what we have found, we need about seven good killing frosts and um, you know at that point that material is, is ready to, and, and it's amazing, I mean it dries and, it's, and, it, uh, and it, it stays erect in the field. Um, we did have a bad experience. We had a farm that had had cut it and bailed it and the doggone stuff got wet and it was shipped in and I mean it was moldy and water was running out of it and we quickly put the kibosh on that. I, I, I told the guys that we're not putting that in a broiler house and, uh, and we didn't. We just simply shipped the grab, we were able to put it back on the truck and we sent it up to, to Kennett Square and they used it in mushrooms. But you've, you've got to take care of this product and it's got to be right, um, you know, for the birds. So, um, yeah, so we, we've learned a lot. Makes sense. Yeah, you, you brought up the issue of land marginality and availability of marginal land to grow these types of crops. That's certainly a big interest of ours uh, in the new bio project. 
you know, you so the Delmarva Peninsula is really nicely situated in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. I know there are other directives looking at the planting of, of perennial grasses in critical riparian zones to prevent nutrient runoff. So you you probably um, you're probably a better person to speak to this, but you probably see a lot of nice opportunities for overlap between uh, this high demand for this type of material and a lot of other incentives for the planting of such material. Yeah, yeah, we, we you know, as I sh Sarah shared with you before, Sarah, we, we have some areas, um, you know, our inland bays, certainly our chop tank, um, you know, the watershed that I'm in, um, you know, the the Chesapeake, a lot of a lot of areas that interface with uh, with with surface water, um, and there I think there are plenty of opportunities. But I want to make it quite clear, um, you know, this product in terms of its value, um, you know, corn and soybeans is going to be our 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 major bread and butter here. Um, I, I'm not naive enough to believe that this product is going to have enough value to replace corn and soybeans and I just need to be upfront about that but I think there's I think enough most, march most I think there's enough farm. marginal there's enough marginal land uh, areas that um, I mean for example Sussex County you know 40 percent of our um, you know of our crop land is now under pivot irrigation and um, and there are areas uh, you know, there are areas that are, are uh, you know, we can't get irrigation to or the land is marginal that, you know, a switchgrass planting makes a lot of sense to me. So, um, you know, so that's that's kind of my take on it. Certainly, yes. I, I think most of our audience would, would agree that uh, you know, most of these perennial crops grown for biomass applications are, are not really lucrative enough to be replacing uh, cash crop ground. And, and I don't think that uh, most of the proponents of those crops would, would really advocate that kind of thing, but where it can jump in and, uh, and create more higher utilization in the landscape in those marginal and underutilized areas are, uh, are quite important. We yeah. have a last one last question from Laura yeah, Fowler. I'm, I'm just Laura Fowler just put one on what how much was the percentage of irrigation? I mean I, I don't know. I, I think in Delaware, uh, twenty five percent probably statewide, but I know in Sussex County, which is our certainly our largest ag county, um, uh, we're approaching forty percent. And uh, you know, I, I look at irrigation as uh, I used to. I was president of Little League, and you know, it's kind of like putting lights on a baseball field. You, uh, you you basically make it twice as productive, and that's exactly what we're seeing here on Delmarva. Um, we're uh, we're making we're making our land more productive, and I think it has nutrient management uh, consequences. Uh, you know, for years we've applied uh, nutrients based upon a history of um, and you know and the big variable that farmers have is hey how much rain are we going to get this year? So if you're applying, you know, if you're trying to grow a hundred and hundred and you know forty five bushel corn. And you harvest 70, well, there's rogue nutrients somewhere, and that ends up in streams. Well, if you can irrigate that and, um, you know, you can take that off in the form of grain, well, that that's a win-win-win for the farmer, for the environment. Um, so there's just a lot of, a lot of things that are.